Thank you for coming. I don't know that Harry has uh, sat in on any of these events. Never. So, <laughs> so just as a preface. There are a lot of stories about. Uh, probably the, all uh, fallacious. Very, uh, the closest analogy people keep referring is a gladiatorial event. Oh, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like uh, Kipnis analysis. Um, but the but the purpose the purpose has to do with students, young architects, and looking at a whole series of decisions that you made that are completely plausible and intelligible to you, but are sitting on a whole series of suppositions and assumptions that have to do with other meanings that I'm not sure you're interrogating at this point, purpose, meaning, why this, why that. Um, so we try to get at a, at, at a few of those uh, uh, points. Uh, the first thing that, that I was just reading your, your text, and there are, wait a second. And in the text, there, there are a couple of words that jumped out on me. One is experimental, and the other is complex. Uh, and your assessment was that what you did here was experimental and that the experience was likely to be complex. And, and the word complex itself in the discourse as you bump into it now is presumed in many cases to be a virtue. So that simple or single-minded um, wouldn't be virtues in the same way that, that, that assigning the label complex would be. So can you tell us what constitutes an experimental point of view in this and what makes it complex? Okay. Well, what makes it experimental in my view is that it takes a, a, a form of architectural intervention, which is very ancient, the hyperstyle, uh, and reinterprets it in a way that is not aimed at proving anything or demonstrating a theory, uh, its purpose in my mind is that I'm just curious about the experiential consequences of reconfiguring the hypostyle in uh, this way. And what do I mean by this way? And that leads me to the word complex. What I mean is that uh, the hypostyle historically, the one constant has always been that the columnar elements are, are solid and they may be round, they may be square, they may be octagonal, they may be any form, but they are solid, they're opaque masses. Uh, and, and as I wrote in my introduction about the precedents, uh, the interesting thing to me about hypostyles has always been that you can take this very simple principle that you array a series of opaque verticals uh, in a, uh, you aggregate them in an orderly way uh, to create a hypostyle. What's interesting to me is the radically different effects produced by doing that, depending on the form and proportion of the columnar elements relative to the spaces between them. And that's why I mentioned uh, at the, uh, and I gave four examples, uh, fairly clear examples, uh, at least three. We'll talk about yeah, the Yeah, anyway, so, uh, uh, 
for me, uh, what makes this complex is that it departs from that premise that the columns are solids and makes the columns more complex in themselves and makes them more, it, it introduces uh, figural space within and between each element. Within because of the way it's shaped and between them uh, because of the way they address each other and of course a complement to that which we can get into later but also as part of the complexity is the roof element. Uh, let, me, let me read that that response back to you in, in a conventional way, if we use the word experiment, I think the two renditions that are plausible, so let me give you this and get your reaction. One would be that we're dealing with subject matter that, assuming you would accept this, that has no precedent in the context of building. I mean, for instance, last night you put up that Kafka quote, mm -hmm. no history, history always starts in the moment that, that we're in. Meaning that what it, it, the connotation of experiment has to do with an effort to make something you don't know how to make, which might rule out the association with a precedent which suggests you're making something that ipso facto has a pedigree. Mm -hmm. So an experiment in that sense would be looking into something that hasn't been looked into yet, assuming that's possible uh, in architecture. And complex would be the reading of it, either as an idea in a drawing or an attempt to understand meaning and finding oneself in difficulty because the reading of the meaning isn't easy. Mm -hmm. And so complex, I'm giving you back a definition which may not be your definition. Complex would have to do with the legibility or lack thereof of the content and then the question would be, is, is the aspiration to make it illegible in perpetuity? Or is it, if you work hard enough, long enough, it will be less and less illegible and more and more legible? Uh, well, to take the last question first, there's no intention on my part to make, uh, to make something illegible. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite. I want something to be very legible. Uh, but I want it to provoke a different reading of the idea of hypostyle. And that's, and the experiment, that's why, you know, if you say experiment is about unpre something unprecedented, uh, I would say, that the most interesting experiments are involved with unprecedented interpretations of, of ancient, of ideas that we inherit. And that's what this is about. It's about an unprecedented interpretation of a very ancient artifact. So ancient, in fact, and so, and so compelling in its presence that, in my view, uh, a person who walked into this space uh, without knowing anything about SciArc or a purpose or a conversation could feel that this hypostyle had been here forever and SciArc had been built around it. And that I think is, that's, that's a quality that I find and it has to do with, and I, it has to do with the particular uh, 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 resonance and the reason that hypostyles have existed in different interpretations through history is that they do seem to have that 
aspect in common, that somehow this ordered array of things creates the impression of permanence, of being there, of having existed, pre-existed, of being not circumstantial, whereas everything around it is circumstantial. So it's about an investigation of that. Uh, it's, it's a curiosity on my part, and, and, and I have to say that owing to your generosity in allowing me to pursue my curiosity, I, I feel, I mean, I, I really want to spend more time in this than I'm going to be able to, but, but it's, it has proved very satisfying to me in terms of uh, satisfying my curiosity, but at the same time uh, raising more questions. I think the, the, the generosity runs the other way. We're happy to have you, and it's, it was a joy to listen to what you did last night. So we, we certainly appreciate your effort. Let me go off the track a little bit, because you said something that, that interested me, and I, I, I want to ask you about it. In terms of the constituency or the audience for architecture, notwithstanding this particular audience in this particular venue in a school, because you made a comment about the prospect for experiencing this by people who may or may not know the meaning or the pedigree of hypostyle, which I want to ask you about in a minute. To whom is this addressed, the project? What's the constituency for the project? I guess I should add, last night when we were, when we were talking, um, you said, I think, for the first time that nobody, you didn't really have a client, nobody was asking you to do X, Y, and Z on this site and this time for this budget with this program. And so in a certain sense, I guess it's, conceivable that you're your own constituency? Although I don't know that that's the answer. Now, I guess the answer would be, is it this group or is it the general public? How, how do you understand the constituency for the project? Well, I mean, I say both and. Uh, certainly I am constituency, uh, one part of the constituency in the, uh, I made this uh, to, this investigation is really uh, very much for myself in a certain way. On the other hand, uh, I would not have made it if I didn't have the hope that the investigation would be interesting to others, that the experiment would be interesting to others. Uh, and I still would insist that it is an experiment, even though it's, I mean, uh, to me, it's about taking something that has a long history, uh, but not a, but a, but not a monolithic history. In other words, the history, the history of the hypostyle is about many different uh, uh, about a very complex discourse between object and space, and the interpretation of that. Dis the, there have been a, a wide variety of interpretations, and I just mentioned three. Uh, and this is, but the one thing that was always constant was the idea of a solid. And I thought it would be interesting to see what would happen if you challenged the idea of the solid. It's no more complicated than that. And I, th and, and I would argue that if you're going to make an investigation of that kind, uh, it's important uh, to make it within the framework of knowns. In other words, you're going to investigate an unknown, and I think this is true in science. If you're going to investigate something, you do it within a framework of known things of precedent in order to discover something. And so to me, it's, 
not only valid but actually necessary that this experiment be conducted within the framework of a tradition uh, which has uh, a long history and many exemplars preceding right. it. I mean, that might raise the question, if the frame of reference within which you're operating, science, architecture, has a perimeter and a pedigree, then is it conceivable that the content of the work ultimately works its way outside of that and becomes something which might have an antecedent, but no longer is part of the lineage of the original pedigree? I would like to hope so. That's an aspiration. Uh, it's an aspiration, and actually, uh, just to continue that a little bit further, one of the, uh, this array is provocative in ways that I hadn't fully anticipated, and therefore, what it, and I already suggested this to the students who made it, that I'd like, I'd, I'd like them to have an opportunity to reorder this hypostyle in different ways. For example, when we were, uh, all of these had to be moved in order to arrange the lighting, uh, which by the way, we wanted to be only up, not to have any direct shadows here. But we had to, we had to move all these elements. And as we move- the doors to cast the shadows. And as we move them- Right. What's that? You want the doors to cast the shadows. We didn't want the doors. You we, don't we, want the doors. We, we, we wanted the light, well, we wanted the daylight to cast shadows, but not artificial light to cast shadows. So we're in this kind of dust condition, which is, so we're only getting a little light. But, but the point I was trying to make is that as we move the doors, very interesting things happen. For example, when you turn these doors on a diagonal and make an exception, it, it, it it produces a completely different reading of the hypostyle. So if I had my druthers, what I would do is to stay here for another week or so and have a group of students with whom I could rearrange these That's elements. a terrific idea. I mean, if you could do it, it would be fascinating. And then the exhibit wouldn't be just one. It would be a sequence of options. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a proposition which is... We should do that. Uh, but 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 it lends itself, even even though it has this sense of permanence, and I believe it does. It's sort of, to me, the fascinating aspect that it feels as if it's been here forever. But uh, nonetheless, they happen to be. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it probably isn't interesting, but it's a fact that these doors weigh each one weighs 60 pounds, and that there are four convenient handholds and four students can quite easily lift it and relocate it and twist it. And the effect when you twist it is remarkable. And, it, and one reason it's remarkable is not so much what it does to the orientation of the column, but what it does to the orientation, what the effect of reorienting the roof element. Right. It's quite remarkable. Let me, uh, let me switch, because I have a, a number of these things and I'd like to try to get through at least a few of them. You know Eames's, Eames's infamous piece, The Powers of Ten, bigger, 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 yes. smaller, 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 mm -hmm. infinitely larger, larger, infinitely smaller, and you never get to the end of the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and the introduction of this, which I, I'd like to talk about, because I don't know quite the meaning of this, and I could give you a reading of all of this, which is an irony or facetious depending on whether you believe Los's book, what the hell was this, <laughs> ornament book, whatever, you, what, what, that, that ornament was a crime or something, I, I don't remember the name. But having made something at one scale <laughs> and having reproduced it by analogy at a different scale, is the implication that, it, that the, the next wide flange or H section 
is in the next space and twice as big. In other words, by producing this at two different scales, have you raised the question of what's the scale? In other words, the thing you're, you and I are sitting in, is that full scale or is this full scale? No. In other words, what's the scale and is this getting bigger? And if you go into, into Losa's tower and you go to the 25th floor and you see a table, and on the table there is another series of columns arrayed in this way, bigger, 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 small. So doesn't it raise the question that the prospect is infinite in both directions? Uh, I think it does, but I would like to say that I'm a believer in, in proportion and scale. And one of the reasons that I chose the three by eight door is that it is a scale and a proportion that is particularly sympathetic to the scale of an individual human being. It's particularly sympathetic. And that's, that's the result of long, I mean, it, it, there are many doors and many proportions, but the three by eight, I would argue, is by far the most satisfying. And it's because of a combination of scale and proportion. So I would argue that these doors are not, it's not just an arbitrary selection of this scale. It could be half the size or twice the size. For me, it's very important, and that's the most important thing about this installation, is that it's a, an actual real scale with real people in it at the real scale. So, my, so, so I'm very attached to this as a real scale. I would not want to reproduce it at half the scale or twice the scale. But have, you've done that in a way. No, this is a totally different proposition. But they're related. Uh, they're related only in the sense that uh, this is a speculation which is related because, because it forms a hypostyle. But the hypostyle, the prop, this is investigating an urban proposition this is investigating an architectural proposition. So, uh, I, I mean, and, and this is odd. It's, it's odd, it's odd, it's odd, but on the other hand, and, and arguably facetious, it's not terribly serious. It's the result of a simple fact that I have always thought the Los proposal for the Chicago Tribune I've always considered it totally absurd as an individual building. And I have, from the beginning, been intrigued by the possibility of it as a multiple, as, as an aggregation. And I, and I have always felt that it is not a credible proposition as an individual, as a singularity, and that it's quite a credible and interesting proposition as uh, 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 for an aggregation. Really? Whatever scale you might say, this is deliberately made to suggest the scale of a town. <coughs> and, and that's, so, so in a way, you're right that I'm kind of introducing a subject here that has nothing to do, the only thing it has in common with the installation is that it's a hypostyle and that therefore we can talk about well, hypostyles you, you get, and an urban You get to scale. say that, you get to say that, but the mere fact that both are present in the same venue, mm -hmm. and this is in the oculus of this, mm -hmm. certainly asks us, you don't have to try too hard, to make an association. It does, I agree, it makes it. it it's it a makes, speculation, right? But it's so. Not, but, but are these are these now high rises actually? No, no. And these are high rises, and a hypostyle hall has gone from Karnak columns and lintels to a city as hypostyle with high rise buildings now replacing the columns in Karnak, Cordoba, Istanbul. Well, all your examples. Yeah. Okay. So now you're challenging me in a way that I, I have to respond uh, more uh, in a more open way. Uh, on the one hand, I feel that these are definitive as an installation, 
and I would insist on that in terms of their scale and proportion. On the other hand, I'm not at all opposed. So, so I, to, to me, to cut them in half, to make them twice as large or twice as small is not interesting. But I certainly would acknowledge that if you imagine these at an urban scale at which each of these one and three quarter inch bars was in fact, let's say, a 40 to 60 foot wide edge of a building. Now that would be an immense building, but that could be an interesting proposition to me. But and it's also- You have to go, in other words, to a much larger scale to make this interesting as a speculation. Right. Well, I don't know that we ever answered the question of whether the double scale implies more of the same. If it doesn't exist physically, it exists in your head. So looking at this, as I said, you anticipate that what's behind us on either side is yet larger in some mathematical or geometric or exponential way, and likewise within here, you know, so it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and smaller and smaller and smaller. Yes. Whether that's implied as soon as you introduce the two scales. Yeah. Uh, well, so, I, I think I'm gonna agree with your uh, suggestion that that int introducing this element, which is clearly a miniaturized scale of an urban proposition, invites invites what you the question that you just asked: Why can't this be a miniaturized version of an urban proposition? And uh, uh, I think it actually could be. And by the way, I think that that in particular. I'm quite interested in understanding how this relationship of vertical to horizontal might work if each of these elements was, let's say, 100 stories tall, which it would have to be in order to make these elements meaningful at an urban scale, because each of these has to go from two inches to 40 feet, which 50 feet, or so, which means that you're taking uh, six times 50, you're multiplying it by 300 times, so this eight foot high is going to be 2,400 feet high. So you're talking about a, a very tall, super tall building, and I think that, inter that would interest me. Isn't it possible that the in a critical discourse, what starts to arrive between us isn't necessarily what you anticipated when you made it. And the art of the artifact is that it suggests possibilities that weren't necessarily in your mind. Absol and, absolutely. And that's a virtue. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, that might be a and reading in the minds of, of complex. Else. That that. Yeah. That, that, that the definition of complex would not only have to do with the, with the nature of the experience, but the reading of the experience. Yeah, and the fact that, and I would agree with you that, that part of complexity is that it opens up possibilities that you hadn't thought of. I would completely agree with that. And I would hope, I mean, I would love to see uh, anyone in this room who is so inclined to take this uh, installation and play with it uh, in their imaginations and make it uh, into a new invention. Which it, could be done as a project. I mean, literally leaving this and just do it in a machine. We could uh, do that. On the other hand, I, I still want to say that for me, uh, there is a mind-body uh, relationship uh, embodied in these constructs that that is uh, not trivial because 
it has to do with because I think it it does uh, uh, invite you to explore your relationship to the world just as uh, in this and one of the reasons it invites it is because the scale and the proportion are meaningful are I mean I, in this I'm sort of you know back to modular and back to the golden mean and this kind of, I think these things I'm a believer in those things I'm a believer in proportion and scale so this is an experiment in proportion for example I don't think I don't think this would have been a very interesting proposition as and it could by the way have been done you could take these four elements and make a square volume without a roof uh, you could do that uh, I don't think that would I don't think that we would find it very interesting let me let me get to uh, to a point that I want to get to the precedence, but I want to ask you, you, you say that that's a door, birch veneered, hollow core door. The reason there are two screws is because the solid piece that holds the door is at the top and the bottom, and there are two screws. So if we get a chance, we'll, we'll talk about that. But back to the question of interpretation or meaning, which conceivably were prone to overdo. If you look at what Loos did as an irony, as a discussion of ornament, as a comment on where he thought architecture might go, and this is, this is done in the early 20s. This is done at the time of futurist stuff, constructivist stuff, the style stuff, Athens Charter guys, constructive. So we know it was around in the early 20s. It didn't look like this. <laughs> if it looked like something very different. So this, yeah. it presumably, this is not Josephine Baker's house. This is something else. So if you look at that, what Loos is saying, not just an object, which has by analogy an association at a different scale with hypostyle, but the meaning of that tower and the context of the time in which it was done. And then you look at the, the wide flange section that you made. Mm -hmm. So let's not say this, that, that's, that that is a wood analogy to the, what is it, five by eight aluminum I section that hangs off the Seagram building in your city and with the little nubs on the end that everybody talked about for years. Is it conceivable that, that the irony that belongs to Los is also associated with your facetious making of a wide flange section which is made out of wood, which it could never be, and has a top which it could never have so that both of the pieces are, are sardonic comments on more conventional subscribe to ideologies in architecture. In other words, that, that this has a completely different meaning, that it's an attack on an ideology that prioritized this is the way we make things and I'm going to hang it on the wall of the building outside the building and I'm going to tell you the 20th century is about steel construction and white flange beams and columns. And you're making fun of that. Is that conceivable? Well, actually I'm not making fun of it. I'm agreeing with it. Because what I'm agreeing with is, is Mises' discovery that uh, the H-shaped mullion is a formally articulate uh, architectural element that has a quality that is totally the opposite of that same element being in a in a rectangular solid. He discovered that. I mean, he, he made that. He didn't discover the I-beam, but he discovered that uh, uh, he 
discovered that way of assembling elements. And it's hugely important. And it's important, by the way, I would argue by analogy, the importance is not unlike the importance here, namely that uh, when you take, uh, let's say, a, a typical eight inch by three inch mullion, and you make it into a rectangle. A uh, tube. A tube. One, one rectangle. A tube, yeah. One, a tube, yeah, you make it into a tube. Right. That tube uh, is a totally different thing from a three by eight eye section. And, and that's not irony or facetious or anything else. It's a reality, it's a formal, it's worth talking about extensively, by the way, but it's not tricky or ironical. Or it's, it's a reality about the way our vision responds to form. Uh, and it has enormous architectural importance. Uh, so I would argue that in a certain sense, this is not in any way uh, thumbing its nose at that, this is on the contrary, in a way, an homage to Mises' discovery of the H. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, let, me, let me ask you about, you mentioned the precedence, and when you walk in just adjacent to the door, you have Cor uh, Karnak, mm -hmm. and you have Cordoba, and you have the cistern across from mm -hmm. Hagia Sophia, and then you have the warehouse, my mm -hmm. arts mm -hmm. warehouse. And I, I just want to raise a question, and, this, this, and you can speculate on the associations. When we say that there is an analog here with a hypostyle hall, aren't you simply talking about technical apparatus and divorcing the technical apparatus from content, from meaning, from history, uh, in contradiction to what you said, and let me tell you why I, 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 I'm suggesting that. If you look at Karnak, and you look at the columns, and you look at the spans, it's conceivable to understand it as, as a field of legs, positioned as a consequence of the capacity to span Mm -hmm. which is not very much, mm -hmm. so that it's a technical piece. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Cordoba, now Cordoba has a different history because I think it was first Roman and then it was Christian and then it's Islamic. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it's a copy of something in Damascus, I think, or at least by analogy, it's very similar. And the double arch is something which has a particular pedigree and its colors and its decoration all belong to associated meanings mm -hmm. of religion and a belief system that a culture who, had in, who inhabited that project would immediately understand. It's like looking at, at, at a rose window in Canterbury. And even if you couldn't read, you know, Thomas a Beckett or something. everybody knows the story. In a, in a contemporary sense, and then we, then we come to the, 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 the cistern, which I know always fascinated me, which I think is made out of Greek column parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, the capital is now the base, mm -hmm. upside down, Medusa, which is either an accident or an intended affront or slight to a previous culture. Mm -hmm. And then you come to the warehouse, which probably for most cultures doesn't have the associated meanings that you and I would attribute to it with the columns and the mushroom heads. And the mushroom heads have to do with shear conditions mm -hmm. and dealing with shear conditions at the, at, 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 at the conjunction of the column and the, and, and the beam or the column and the roof. So what I would say is that there are very particular cultural and religious meanings associated with the first three. The fourth is quite different and appeals to an architectural constituency, but not to a general constituency, and it has no story 
except the technical story. So the only thing that associates these, and again, if you go back to Karnak, and I have to apologize for it taking so long, but if you go back to Karnak, you could make an argument that hypostyle halls belong to the capacity to span. So I would say the, associate, the associative value belongs to the technology, but not to the meanings. That the meanings here, then, are quite different than maybe share something with a warehouse. No, I, I, I mean, in too sense, much? I agree with everything that you've said, uh, but I'm also going to declare that what you said is irrelevant to, to this exercise. Because this exercise is not about meaning, it's about the power of the formal power of certain objects and spaces, the assemblage of certain objects and spaces uh, to, uh, to uh, engender a reaction in a human being. It has nothing to do with the program or the meaning or anything. I mean, I completely agree with you that, that there are technical issues that are involved and cultural issues and issues of meaning that are fundamental to all those examples, including the warehouse, by the way. Uh, but you see, that's not what this experiment is about. This experiment is about those qualities, those formal qualities that transcend all of that. So I'm not concerned about the technical rationale behind the columns. I'm not concerned about the programmatic rationale, even the cultural context of them. What I'm concerned about is the formal power of them and the way they communicate. And it's that formal power transcending all cultural meanings, of course, that's the argument. I, I, that I understand that. I, I, it's, an, it's a fascinating answer. And I, I, I mean, I give you, it's not so much a rebuttal. I don't know if you get to do that quite. And I'll tell you why I say that. In a talk, I did a talk the other night here, and I put up a painting of Durer's. And it was done early in the 16th century, and it's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it's spectacular, it's a woodcut, it's extremely beautiful, no question about it. So in the current street corner lexicon, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's powerful, but in the culture that it, where it was produced, it has a meaning that may precede the fact that the artist had an extraordinary talent, which is a story which comes out of revelation that everyone shared. And the question is whether you can, and maybe you can, and maybe in the end, architecture is about the lyric and not the dialectic. But I'm, I think, trying to argue it's more of a dialectical lyric, meaning they're all somehow involved. And that the meaning of Karnak has everything to do with, with the significations of the tops of the columns, with the fact that some columns, I think, are 10 meters, other columns are 20 meters. So the heights vary, which is another piece of hypostyle, hypostyle typologies that they change, and they change for organizational reasons, the clear story reasons, whatever the hell it is. So I, I, ex I, I accept the argument that in the end, the power of the content trumps everything, but in the context of a discussion like this, I still would argue that the associative meanings, which you raised, sure. because you could say that's fair enough, but irrelevant, but the reason I raised it is because they're on the wall. Yeah, and I'm not, and, and, and you see, I, unfortunately, I, I tend to be one of these people that, that cannot disagree with every way of approaching this issue. I cannot, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna sit here and say that meaning, cultural meaning and cultural context is of no significance. Right. It's of enormous significance. Uh, uh, on the other hand, mm -hmm. all I was trying to do was to set the stage for this experiment. <coughs> and perhaps in doing so, I oversimplified the issue, but I was trying to point out that 
hyperstyles historically, for whatever reason, technical reason, cultural reasons, any a wide variety of very interesting reasons, they have very different consequences within the same basic premise, namely the ordered array of vertical elements in a very rigorous and conceptually limitless field. That's right. the most interesting thing about a hyperstyle is that on the one hand it is highly ordered and on the other hand it is conceptually limitless. Right. That what we're sitting in is conceptually limitless. And those, all those hyperstyle examples that I gave are conceptually limitless. Right. Well, it, one of the things I asked, and I don't know that we ever answered it, is whether, at least in our imagination, that this would all keep going. And there's a, there's, there's a further prospect in that, that not only would the green grid keep going and the mm -hmm. I-section columns keep going, but they might go at different rates or dissipate in a different way. Right. And you forgive me for doing this because as soon as anybody puts something up, as you know, and you're as good right. at it as anybody, you can always say, yeah. yeah, you did that great. Why didn't you do the other thing? Well, let me... A, so, but for, for, for the sake of discussion, in other words, let's say the grid ran to the street. Yeah. And let's say, you know, so that, that the fact that they're confined within a limited perimeter and everything exists within the same perimeter, it's at least hypothetically possible that the grid belongs to one association or the columns belong to a different association. It, it's, it's, yes. It, it, I want to, I don't think this is quite answering your question, but it's important to me because I brought it up in the lecture last night. I want to refer to the water garden at Fountain Place, which is one of Dan Kiley's most interesting works. That water garden is composed of a hypostyle of columnar trees, 15 feet on center, rigorously. The ground plane changes, Some, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's sloping, but it's a rigorous array of 15 foot thing. Now, the, th the extraordinary thing, but this is getting, getting to your question, the extraordinary thing about that array and the reason that it became, I, I don't want to use the word popular, but the reason that it was so well received by people in Dallas had nothing to do with architecture critics. The reason that it became so popular as a place to go in Dallas is precisely be because the hypostyle has an extraordinary quality you can see it here, which is that on the one hand, it is permeable. It, offer, it creates no boundary. And this, the site of Fountain Place is surrounded by parking lots. A big problem. We didn't want to create a wall, but we wanted, I mean, to create a wall is to hem yourself in and make yourself, trying to make a secret garden. We couldn't do that in a commercial project. What, we, what Dan Kiley did was something much more effective. He created the hypostyle of trees, and the effect of that hypostyle is that when you leave the street and you enter that field, you, the, the environment is transformed immediately without any edge, and yet there is no defined edge, no wall, no nothing. The spatial space is absolutely continuous, and yet as soon as you enter that hypostyle of trees, it's magic. It's, uh, that's the magic of the hypostyle. So when I say it's conceptually limitless, I don't mean that it should go on forever, but rather that uh, it creates a, a, a porous and permeable and yet highly defined spatial construct. Right. Uh, let me ask you this, it related to what you just said in terms of the approach to this. Um, I, I, I give you a brief story. I was in a discussion the other night about Holocaust memorials, and it was a, a conference of, of, of uh, uh, various people who talk about things related to that, not so much architects. And the, the Berlin project next to the Brandenburg Gate came up with the... Mm -hmm pieces. And I was sitting about, I don't know, a few months ago in a hotel in Vienna waiting for something. It's raining. I turn on the television and here's a program on that memorial in Berlin. 
And what the guy had done, or what the, what the program was, it was a BBC program, and they set up a camera, and they shot down the aisle, and they did it for an hour. And what they found, and this is a memorial for the Jews and the Holocaust and all of that, and what they saw was boyfriend, girlfriend behind the columns, little kids running around eating yogurt, skateboarders jumping from the top of one piece to another. And then you had some older characters who were, who were griping that this was a misunderstanding of the purpose. And it's fascinating because it's a piece of urbanism with no Barneys and no Prada and no Reebok and no Nike. And it is a kind of fascinating discussion. But it has everything to do in, in terms of this question with how you come at this. For instance, you come at this from the top. Oh, yes, it's very different. It's a very different, it's a very different proposition. And by the way, this is a wonderful... If we had figures, in other words, like... Um, like Zago, and you already mentioned Zago's piece at the very beginning, mm -hmm. that had musicians and other characters eating and drinking and playing, whatever the hell he did up there, but it was inhabited. And if you had people jumping from place to place, yes, or understanding the purpose of this, not so much from the ground, because you've made it available. Karnak's not available from the sky. That's right. Cordoba, well, Cordoba has a kind of mezzanine. So, but but the, the vantage point, how you inhabit this, or how you access it, so yeah. you've made it accessible in a way that the hypostyle hall is not accessible. I, I, well, well, I made you, it visible. Yes, yeah. you don't see hypostyles from above, and this is, in that sense, unique and it's an experiment, and it's actually quite interesting. Here, here I think a visual analysis could be quite interesting because uh, we calculated today that these, uh, if you take the total floor area of this space and the total f area of the 20 uh, doors, three by eight doors, you'll find that the 20 doors occupy exactly 36% of the floor area. And yet, when you look down from above, I would say the power of those horizontals is much greater than you would imagine for something that only occupies 36% of the space. But it gives you a very different reading. It does. It's very different. Of, so most of the discourse here has to do with what you call the power of the space, never mind some theoretical or intellectual or dialectical argument we could have another time. So you're going for the power of this. Yeah, it's down here. Yeah. It's not up here. Up here, you have a reading of, of, the, of the concept in a totality which you never get from the ground. You do. And, and you and, made both of them available. But I'd be quite interested, again, imagining this in an outdoor space or in a space where people... Yeah, right. I, and actually, I really like the idea that you've just suggested that there could be habitation or there could be activity up there, uh, that there could be access. I'm not quite sure. I mean, we've already, it's already been suggested that it would be nice if people could sit on those edges. Uh, it's kind of an interesting position to be an audience up there. But uh, by the way, uh, can I, uh, interrupt with something rather sure. trivial, but oh, nonetheless, to me, entertaining. Uh, you know, these these uh, low towers were made uh, naturally in a 3D printer, and uh, 3D printers tend to fail, and ours failed during the making one night when they were being made, and the result is that I got a series of partial low towers. Uh, and this enabled me f to do something that you guys do here all the time, or at least I know it's a common word. I, f I discovered finally what a kit bash is. <laughs> and, and I want to bring you, uh, take this to Eric, if you will. That's, that's a kit bashed Los Column. Now, now, the interesting thing about that. It's Palladio, huh? To me, uh, to me the, the interesting discovery for me, and it's totally unanticipated, 
is that whereas I consider the Los Tower as an individuality to be absurd, I find that to be a very credible building. I find but that she didn't include it. I find, well, no, because it came to, it was an accident. I, you know, I, I, if, if well, the I question time, is whether you get to I include time, accident. I, well, I, I just wanted, it, it came out and I, and I was. Can I keep this? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too attached to it. <laughs> we but, see this going up in Singapore tomorrow. But, but, uh, but I, what fascinated me about it is that I found it to be so much more credible as a building than the individual one. And I'm quite interested, actually. I could imagine myself doing a building like that, but not like that. Let me, but on, on the other hand, as an urban proposition, I'm still attached to this. So I think, I think I would argue that the fact that the 3D printer turns out something you didn't anticipate ought to leave you open to the prospect that the original, what you originally anticipated, can evolve in the process of making it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what you started with isn't necessarily what you're obligated to finish with. So you have decisions all the way down the line. Yes. That's why when, when somebody is doing DD and somebody is doing construction documents and it's a process of grinding it out, you lose the associational meaning with content. That introduces this prospect of different content. Yeah. Well, this brings me back to the question that you raised. I'm really quite interested in seeing what would happen if if this order was disrupted by one or two rogue elements, because as soon as you introduce a diagonal into this, it becomes, I mean, this diagonal. Well, there is a 45, what is? So if you turn. It's 45 degrees, isn't it? Yes, it's 45 degrees, but as soon as, so yeah. this, this, uh, what did Le Corbusier call them, guideline, this, this guideline is essential to the, to the organization of this hyperstyle, but it's essential uh, as a complement because the hyperstyle itself is orthogonal and this is diagonal. But if you take one of those elements and rotate it to be diagonal, I guarantee you, just because I saw it happen yesterday, that it's going to transform this space in a way that I'd like to investigate. That's what I mean by experiment. I'd really like to investigate. We should, we should do that. We'd do it and send it to you. The question <laughs> is whether, whether the, the column elements would be rotated so that they follow the a priori green grid, or whether once you're within the grid, you can do whatever you want you with could. the column. You could put the column in any order because there's a fundamental organizational principle operating, yeah. which is you get to put the column somewhere in the square. Mm -hmm. Column, square. Mm -hmm. But the relationship of the column and the square could vary as opposed to all the columns are associated. Yeah. And, and uh, if I were going to go further with this, what I'd like to have, I don't think Sarek is going to go f give me the budget for it, but what I would like to do is to put all these on some kind of a of a turntable with some kind of uh, remote electronic control so that as people walked through this space these things would respond rotate respond yeah. I mean that would be fascinating and by the way I think we are beginning to enter an era in which it will be possible to have such mobile elements in architecture. Well, there are, there are obviously, you know, you step over the line and the lights go on and things like that. Yes. What you run into, if one person steps over the line one way, the other person steps over yes. the line, and you got one thing going yes. this way and the other thing going this way, gets to be a kind of Xbox. Yes. yes. I don't know, so do you play Xbox? Something has to have priority. Anyway. Let me ask you one other thing, uh, Harry. The, with respect to drawing this as a conceptual model as a plan or as a section? In other words, is this, as you understand it, or as you make projects, originating in the association of a series of lines that exist in a plane and then extend some dimension vertically but don't vary as they extend in section? 
In other words, if you drew the section through this space at any elevation, unless you get to the top, so maybe this is where the section is, but in other words, is this that we're inhabiting, is it a plan or is it a section? I'm not sure that I understand the question. I'm sorry. Uh, Let me try, I try it again. If you look at the relationship between the green grid yeah. and the H columns as two elements, the doors, the H's, mm -hmm. where they sit within the proposition of the grid, mm -hmm. I mean, there's another discussion, which is which comes first, the grid or the column, they did different discussion. But if you look at that organizationally, does that forecast what the final result is or do you need another component, a dimensional component, a spatial component that says, what does it do going vertically? In other words, is the controlling element of this a plan discussion or a section discussion or how do the two interrelate? Well, here I'm gonna try to squirm out of this uh, by saying that uh, it's both because it's about proportion. So for me, it, it, proportion involves both plan and section equally. So I would argue that this hyperstyle, that in this hyperstyle as it's imagined and as it's been uh, executed here, scale and proportion are crucial and that means that section and plan are in some way equal players. How do you know when to stop vertically? Because that's what I say. I believe that this particular door, pro, this particular proportion eight, of three feet? foot, three foot wide and eight foot eight. high, is a particularly uh, comfortable. And I don't use that. It's a it's a comfortable scale uh, and a comfortable proportion and therefore it's pleasurable. That's, it's pleasurable to be in a well-proportioned, well-scaled space and both plan and section are implicated, are essential in the making of that construct. So uh, I, uh, again, I don't want to, to say that, I, I don't want to attach more significance to this than it deserves. But I would argue that proportion and scale are of the essence in this installation. If you, if you look at, however, the section of the space, you know, there's a low ceiling over there, there's a higher roof structure over here. Mm -hmm. When you're in that space, you know that the space in front of the high court building in Chandigarh, it's, you put a canopy up there, light mm -hmm. stuff with a bunch of steel pipes, and you can stick your hand up and you bang into it. So in spite of, uh, in spite of the giant columns and where the courts, uh, the courts are, you have this entry portico, mm -hmm. which you can reach up and touch. Mm -hmm. So some things you can touch and some things only God can touch or something. And in this space, there, the, the consistency of the section, notwithstanding the inconsistency of the space that it's in. And the question is, if the response in the lower section is a relationship to the ceiling, should we have taken another door in here and doubled it so that, that the relationship to the volume, because you said to me that one of the, one of the goals was, I'll, this is not the word you use, but to make a field rather than an object yeah. which associates with the space that it's in and the legibility of the object in the space is compromised, it certainly was with Andy's, because it's so filled up you can't really see anything but the pieces. Mm -hmm. But the fact that this is lower mm -hmm. gives a very different legibility to the piece in the high space yeah. than and the it, piece in the low yeah. space. And I, would, and, and I would say that it's just lucky that the low space is higher than eight feet and it's nine feet and <laughs> therefore it's, it's just luck. But that's why I say it, it, it you see it makes, to me it, it kind of, confirms my, strengthens my feeling that these elements 
were not installed this week or this month. They've been here forever. And somebody came along and decided to build a building around it. And they needed uh, to create a mezzanine up there, so they created a mezzanine up there. But, and, but the, the permanence, like, the eternal... I like that. The eternal permanence... I really is, like that. ...is undisturbed. Yeah. That's what I, so... That's uh, a different story. It's, it's uh, yeah. I mean, but it's, it was very important to me, obviously, to, to be, uh, to understand, and uh, uh, the first thing I received when you asked me to do this was the plan and section. Right. And, and right away, I mean, the fact that <coughs> that ceiling is nine feet is extremely important. Obviously, the uh, space changes back there, and it happens actually to lend itself then to the idea of putting the wall plaques on it and making something different back there. But nonetheless, it actually, for me, enhances the sense of the integrity and permanence of the hyperstyle as a construct. It, it's been here forever. So. It should say this somewhere. So you precede the building. You're a contemporary of Karnak. And later on, somebody came and built a train station and happened to build around it. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I have one small other question that occurred to me. The way you attach the doors at the edges of the doors, the mm -hmm. hollow core doors, they're two hex head screws. Mm -hmm. If I came along and put a third screw in the middle, assuming I could find something to attach it to, so it attached to the door that it was perpendicular to, what would your response be to that? Well, I, it would be superfluous, and I'm a minimalist, so I don't want... I You're want what? what it, I'm a minimalist. I want what is necessary and no more. And what you need to make this work, you need two screws on each side here, two screws on each side there, and four screws there. That's the minimum number of screws required to make this construct stable. Uh, and those screws have to be very precisely placed because these are hollow core doors. Right. And therefore, they must be placed within one inch of the edge. And that's, it's as simple as that. But I'm happy with the precision that this was done. I mean, these are such, you know, one of the great things about our culture in a way is that we can rely, you can order 20, 80 hollow core doors, eight by three, and you can rely on the dimensional accuracy of those doors. That, that's the culture we live in. You can order them, they come to you, they're dimensionally accurate, you're gonna be able you know that's quite an amazing thing, and 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 for me, uh, working with something where you know that you know it's an imposition on a team of students to put these things together, having starting with something that is so uh, precise in its proportions, so precise in its scale, and so precise in its dimensions that they're absolutely reliable. I think you can feel it here, you can feel it. It feels crafted, well-crafted. Yeah. It's but well I mean, I, not, to, not to beat it to death, but on the other, I mean, you could have countersunk the hole, put in the screw, filled the hole, and nobody would see anything, which well, would be I, even more minimal than the minimal two but screws. I, but I'm not interested in that. I like to see the hole. I like people to appreciate the fascinating. that that's why the, that's why the holes are where they are. And, and I also quite deliberately, I mean, John asked me, uh, sent me an email a few days ago saying these doors all have uh, on the edges, on one edge of each door, there's a stamped lettering that says exactly where and when the door was made. It has a date, the origin, everything. Well, it's 3000 BC, I think. He said, <laughs> he said, should we sand that down? And I said, no, absolutely not. I love the fact that on each door, if you look, walk around it, 
uh, it only you only see the horizontals, of course, because that's when he's it's always on the short edge, and only the horizontal. But on one short edge of each of these roofs, you will find stamped the date and origin. And to me, that yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of a record. Of, I mean, isn't it wonderful that you can do that? That these you can order this stuff and it arrives and it's dependable and it's it gets you off to such a fantastic start. But it ruins your story. <laughs> so there are two stories. What's that? There are two stories. Uh huh. They're not a single story. There's a production, construction, technical capacity story. Yeah. And then there's the story that the, the origins of this are lost in time. And the meaning of the content precedes the contemporary capacity to make doors that are all the same. Two stories. So I would say it may be minimal in effect, but it's certainly maximal in terms of its content and the variety yeah. of interpretations. I think that's part of what you did. Yeah, it is, it's, it's kind of magical to me that, that uh, you can take something uh, that is uh, in a sense as an individual element the door is maybe meaningless as a form but when you assemble them and you can assemble them very precisely because they've been made so precisely and once you assemble them you get something which by virtue of its precision feels eternal by virtue of the fact that it, it doesn't feel as if it's been subject to whim or to anything. It feels as if... But it, but it has, I mean, part of the appeal is that it has multiple associations, and I think we've gone through them. It has associations with Karnak, but yeah. it has associations with technical construction capacity, yes. with fabrication. It's a door. Yes. So it's a door, it's a column, it's an H, it's all of those things. I think yeah. that would make it, as a reading, more than minimal. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I don't want to, I mean, I didn't want to make an issue out of my being a minimalist. No. Everybody knows I'm a minimalist. We don't, it's not an interesting subject. I don't know that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to load this thing with more uh, weight or theoretical weight or cultural meaning than it deserves. I just hope that people will enjoy it and that it will provoke some thought about how forms can be arranged in space, in light, uh, that you would find provocative and interesting. I mean, this is what a school is about. And that's why this gallery, I mean, this is unique. I, nobody, well, I'm sure other schools have galleries, but nobody has a gallery that you have developed in the way that this is where you invite uh, a series of experiments and I think the six week sequence is right because six weeks is long enough I wish I were going to be here it's long enough for people to visit several times in different moods in different lights feeling happy feeling sad uh, and get a sense of what it uh, you know, so that the experiential consequence of this, I think, I would like to believe is helpful to people who are trying to figure out what their life in architecture might be. I think, I think you've achieved all of that. And I think this is an unusual moment last night and this afternoon or this evening in terms of what you've given to the school and the content that you've shared and this, the, the heart in the work and the spirit in the work, which as we said last night, you can't make a facsimile of, you can't fake it. It's not a subterfuge. It's you and it's architecture and it's a story of architecture. And we're making, and I think you know this, and we've never done this before, a book with the text and the images from the lecture that you did last night, will be, which will be issued as a text to acknowledge what you did here and when you did it 
and the contribution you've made to, to, the, to the artistic and intellectual and conceptual power that you delivered. And, and I think from our point of view, from the school point of view, from my point of view, I want to thank you for your effort and your time and your commitment, enduring commitment to all of this. It's terrific. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.